Last group of exhibits, Home Alone 1 and 2, both of the Genesis, while the former also has a Game Gear part. All by Sega, while the Genesis and Game Gear versions of Home Alone were both developed by Brian A. Rice Incorporated, with Al Baker and Associates joining them for the Game Gear part. The latter, Home Alone 2 on Genesis, was actually developed by Interactive Designs. Almost like the other Home Alone games that were previously discussed, this game and its Game Gear counterparts are way more faithful to the film than meets the eye. Upon starting, we're acquainted with an options menu where you can change your difficulty mode, beginner or expert, the latter of which are allowed more weapon parts, which I'll get to momentarily, and control configurations, and even test the songs out. Following that, we see Kevin in a top view perspective where you can control the speed and location of the sled within which he travels. You can actually travel around Kevin's turf, running over random snowmen to gather various items, including various traps, and custom weapon parts to snuff the hell out of the wet bandits, judging from their usual signature OK plumbing van. Your basic controls are as follows. As always, your D-pad moves Kevin around, both in his sled and on foot within a certain house. A, B, N, or C, depending on your personal preferences, same story with the Game Gear Edition, and said case buttons 1 and 2, can be used to fire your weapon, bust out your tire for jumping capabilities, only available in the Genesis version, or just flat out perform a normal jump, not to mention accelerate your sled whilst outside. If I were you, I'd keep a close eye peeled on that charge meter. The more you accelerate your sled, the less likely it is to travel moderately. Upon entering a certain house, you can then set up your traps within any area of said house to the dim-witted, dastardly dickweed duo break-in. After that process, we're treated to an all-new, if somewhat familiar, side-scrolling concept. Except Kevin has real weapons at his disposal this time around, the first of which is a BB gun, like in the film, again, which I'll also get to momentarily. As you're storming your desired house, and everyone thereafter, be sure to collect every other feasible weapon part, and or valuable, if there are any, contained within, while avoiding unexpected hazards and distractions, including Buzz's pet tarantula, randomly formed cracks in the old house, if you walk in or jump accidentally anywhere, a quarrelsome poltergeist in the colonial house that'll zap yours and the wet bandit's asses if your wits aren't sharp enough, a stray cat in the country house, and even a rampaging housekeeper robot in the modern house. Upon the arrival of the wet bandits, and this is where the excitement elevates beyond belief, be sure to prevent those ass wipes from looting every safe within the house by capping their pretentious asses, hence the paint meter that goes up. This also happens every time Harry or Marv get affected by a certain hazard or trap. Okay, onto the weapons and traps. Aside from your traditional BB gun, you can actually assemble or take apart different types of ammo and platforms, and even operators, so if I were you, I'd pick the right ones very carefully. And take note of the possible combinations shown below. MacGyver, eat your heart out. And watch your ammo meter at all times, cause your current weapon will run out quicker than half the duration of, say, an episode of Twin Peaks. Also, take special notice of the brief delay that occurs whenever Kevin fires his weapon, unnerving as it is. It's rather helpful when it comes to getting the timing down pat whenever either one of the two crooked cock knockers approach you. Same story with the collision detection when it comes to certain jumping and landing tactics. Getting to the traps and hazards, Kevin can usually place the following items on his desired house's blueprints every time he enters one. For example, he's got the blowtorches like in the film, which are only good for one use. Remember when Harry goes to the rear door, and all of a sudden one of them just starts automatically lighting right on top of his noggin? Not to mention thumbtacks, ice glaciers, grease, tar, and even random toys and marbles. Be forewarned, after setting them up, you have to avoid these as well while preparing for the arrival of Kevin's worst adversaries. Should you get nabbed at any time, they'll stick you on a picture hanger on the wall, thus leaving you in suspended yet temporary movement, at which point you can then weasel your way off. Also, should those douchebag wet bastards happen to loot every safe in your current house, it then gets flooded, hence their name, and are frozen in the Game Gear version's case. Thus, Kevin fails his mission, becoming prohibited to set foot in that house for the rest of the game. And if every other house on the turf meets that very same fate, hence the house's left indicator, it's an instant motherfucking game over. Therefore, I'd put in every goddamn ton of effort in immobilizing their asses at every turn and maxing out that pain meter, no matter how much or how long it takes, hence the provided ETA on the screen until the fuzz arrive. In the beginner and expert modes, you're timed with 20 minutes and 40 minutes respectively. As for the overall gameplay and control scheme, Sega and the combined efforts of Brian A. Rice and Al Baker and Associates really had their work cut out for them in making a simple, if sometimes flawed, concept, and doing its source material way more justice than those atrocious as balls THQ renditions for every Nintendo system, despite how monotonous the routine can get after a given period of time. Challenge-wise, once again, it depends on the difficulty mode you set at the beginning. 
so I suggest referring back to the aforementioned durations given for each mode. More than that, not only will the Wet Bandits have a randomized as hell root in expert mode, in other words, your first house doesn't always have to be the mansion unlike in the beginner mode, most of the item placements for certain houses also meet the same fate. In other words, not only will the same snowman be lying around, certain items will be rearranged whenever you enter a different house. And yet again, you'll be experimenting with different weapon combinations in between each play, not only in the aforementioned expert mode, but also in beginner, the latter of which are also allowed an auto assemble feature. In addition, the timing of Kevin's weapon firing, avoiding and fending off Harry and Marv at every turn, and even the jumping and landing tactics, as mentioned before, also add to the challenge, so I'd vary my strategies in between each play if I were you. Graphically, while the Game Gear version's visuals are simplistic and tasteful, yet atrocious, the Genesis version outdoes its handheld counterpart by two shakes of a cat's whisker, if not by much. The usual opposing characters look to some degree like their film counterparts. The backgrounds for certain houses and even the top few exteriors aren't something to be mocked at here. They definitely portray the joyous holiday theme that it presents, no matter what situation Kevin's in. And as flattering and whimsical as most of the animations are, including those of the Wet Bandits whenever they get immobilized at every turn, not to mention the addition of various traps and characters, they tend to lose their spark after quite some time. In terms of music and sound, composed and orchestrated by Cliff Falls and Rolf Weber, each and every original track offered throughout each situation is nothing short of satisfying, even with its diverse array of themes for each appropriate house Kevin explores, no less. The sound effects, however, as appropriate and zany as they are, I have no other alternative but to look the other damn way. Other than that, Sega and the combined efforts of Brian A. Rice and Al Baker really went the extra mile in staying true to its source material, though the overall soundtrack isn't anything close to or remotely like the John Williams film score. The Game Gear version, however, is composed of nothing more than semi-bastardized renditions from its Genesis counterpart. And finally, for their replayability, thanks to the two aforementioned diverse difficulty modes and the respective sets of benefits and restrictions they have to offer, Home Alone for both the Genesis and Game Gear is definitely something you'll want to come back to more often than one could possibly expect, notwithstanding all the horseshit you'll endure throughout. I'd say, give both versions a lick or two. For the absolute last time, refer back to the plotline for the second film. Here, however, instead of starting off in the Plaza Hotel, the game opens up for us at the airport, where Kevin realizes the irony of his fate. Basically, we're back to dull-ass, knock-off, point-A to point-B platformer universe. There, we're treated to avoiding and or thwarting every distraction imaginable. Various passengers, security guards, baggage claim workers, city thugs, unsuspecting neighbors, and the like. And of course, as we'd expect, the wet, aka sticky, bandits. The rest of the itinerary here includes various New York City outskirts and exteriors, Duncan's toy chest, the usual Uncle Rob's townhouse and its inner sewage system, and finally Central Park leading up to the iconic Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, resulting in a unanimous total of eight stages. Your basic controls include using the D-pad to move Kevin around, as usual, and even duck or jump down from various obstacles in conjunction with said ability, Contra style, aim his desired weapon in conjunction with firing, A, B, and or C, which you can swap out of the option screen, again, like most Genesis games, either makes Kevin jump, perform any special, especially pushing support items, and or activating any button or other environmental device, and or fire off his weapon. In the beginning default case, he's got a baseball and or a slingshot, or any later singular or homemade weapon, that is, if you've made any effort to collect its parts. Kevin's even got his trademark slide, performed simply, as ever, by pushing down on your D-pad while running, best used for avoiding certain enemies, in the style of those horrendous second to third rate Nintendo THQ versions discussed earlier. Getting to the usual bread-and-butter power-ups, the holiday presents spread throughout various stages grant you extra points, depending on the color, various food items that restore Kevin's health, including milk cartons, water bottles, lunch boxes, and your usual Zaws. Also, the Turtle Dove ornaments from the film, sold by Duncan, portrayed by Eddie Bracken, which are intended as symbols of friendship and love, grant him an extra life. As mentioned before, you have to collect various homemade weapon parts while roaming around in a certain level before reaching those goddamn sticky bandit fucks, just like the previous Sega Home Alone game, not to mention every other last one discussed previously. Should Kevin happen to get his ass handed to him way too much at any point, especially either while or before confronting them, not to mention every other goddamn unsuspecting enemy seen throughout, it's an instant fucking life loss. 
you only get either 3, 4, or 5 lives via the option screen, and a few limited continues. Should the continue countdown reach zero, it's an instant fucking game over, followed by a cutscene with Kevin being shipped away on a train while his longtime rivals are yapping their asses off about their long overdue success. Bottom line, don't even think about letting that shit happen, ever. Thought I was gonna forget about the commonplace traps and hazards? Guess the fuck again. In the airport stage, for instance, you can actually wipe out those security guard dickweeds by setting off a water puddle trap, and even fend off the wet bandits by not only using your homemade weapons, but also various traps in later stages, including, once again, like the film, the aforementioned Uncle Rob's townhouse stage. And don't even get me started with the baggage claim luggage and those obnoxious ass stray cats in the later stages. Control wise, though they tend to be derelict and off the market times, they're not way too goddamn convoluted to say the least, unlike those THQ abominations mentioned previously, and can take an eternity within another to get down pat. In terms of challenge, while it's obvious that Kevin will do his absolute damnedest to defend himself, he tends to get his ass handed to him more often than not, due in part to the player's attention span. For instance, the suitcases of the businessmen you wipe out are launched at you in a flash, which is why I suggest timing my evasion in advance. As a preposterous pain in the ass as this game can get, it's honestly not impossible, that is, versus the previous Sega Home Alone game. It's a trifle more forgiving in terms of outwitting certain enemies. Avoiding other hazards, however, is where true dedication and constant strategy recollection are massive pluses in my book. Although they're a bit more dull than last time despite how ambitious Sega and its new team of developers, specifically the preceding interactive designs, were attempting to be, the graphics are actually attractive as, say, your one true love, if in full honesty not by much. In addition to the usual primary opposing characters, most of the supporting and or opposing characters are much more true to life compared to its Nintendo renditions, same story with the cutscenes. Additionally, as for the backgrounds, as repetitive and depth lacking as they might appear to be even at first glance, their light years far from dissatisfying, and do quite a fascinating job at recreating the film. As far as music and sound, composed and orchestrated this time around by Paul Gadbois and Dave Delia, beginning with the title theme, reminiscent of Darling Love, The E Street Band, The Miami Horns, and Van Zant's All Alone on Christmas, heard during Kevin's Turing montage in the film, and also heard at the end of the game. The game's original soundtrack is nothing short of invigorating, though it can get caustic at certain times, my personal favorite being the airport slash game over theme. In addition, the sound effects, though unfitting, are definitely not something to be mocked at here, especially the voice sound bites of certain characters, including good old Kevin. And finally, for replayability, more often than not, you'll be diving back into this entry much more so than those second-rate Nintendo counterparts, mostly for the sake of memorizing almost every last area following Stage 2, that is, the airport's baggage claim area, aka what Kevin likes to call the Land of Lost Luggage, to avoid having his little ass handed back to him countless times. My first impulse, in full honesty, was to give this game an honest pass, but once again, as merciful as I am, why not a potential fucking fighting chance instead? So, what's our final verdict on every Home Alone game discussed so far? With the exception of the Sega lineup, namely Home Alone for the Genesis and Game Gear, and maybe Home Alone 2 on Genesis, every other version that we've discussed, namely the THQ renditions for the Nintendo systems, are nothing more than yet another series of excuses to cash in on the success of the first two films, despite their attempts to capture their overall themes, and are even more annoying and abysmal than both the mind-controlling SETI eels in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and the Bog of Eternal Stench in Labyrinth combined. In other words, those games are a disgrace to the pint-sized suburban and urban Raiders legacy. Seriously, they all make Beam Software's Bad Street Brawler look like Technosoft's Naketsu Oyako. Though they do have their iconic and recognizable moments, their combined overall commonplace and unfathomable elements in every department and tedious monotony far outweigh the fuck out of whatever virtues those aforementioned versions might have had. As for the Sega Home Alone games, in spite of the dilemmas that they harbor, which I'm in no position to reiterate, they're definitely the better group of games that excel in every common department, especially the second Home Alone game. Bottom line, you're better off with the Sega versions. I highly recommend them more than ever, for sure. But whatever you do, avoid the Nintendo versions like Hurricane Katrina, Snowstorm Juno, Global Warming, and Mudslides combined. Now before I go, I'd like to take this opportunity and thank Riley Sky 100 for this unforgettable collaboration. I'm Riley Sky. Until next time, see you all later. Until then, you filthy animals. This is the Hardcore Retro God signing off. <laughs>